Social equity is a broad concept here, and if you're talking about equality, I think one of the major determinants of inequality in a modern society is the skills of its population. And if you have an unskilled population where some very smart people may go to school, a lot of people who maybe aren't quite as smart, or many even possibly very smart people can't go to school or don't get school, then I think you have a very inequitable society and one that's economically efficient, inefficient one that actually throws away opportunities and it throws away productivity. So in the issue of building skills, especially skills early in life, these policies that actually promote social mobility, that promote the base of skills, that actually lead to enhanced outcomes for society, those skills uh, are so important and we can tackle questions of inequity and inefficiency by essentially providing a base to, to foster those skills. So I think that's the lesson from a lot of studies around the world, and I think that's really quite, uh, quite a powerful lesson. I think what societies have to do, I think we're talking about governmental commitments and the kind of interactions uh, with society that governments would, 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 would try to conduct. Wise governmental policy respects the fact that the early years are so important, and understanding how important those early years are we should really think that we should not be what's sometimes called penny-wise and pound-foolish. We should understand that early childhood programs are actually very, very effective in terms of benefit-cost ratios and in terms of providing uh, an enhanced uh, capabilities for society. So if you were to do a wise governmental policy using cost-benefit analysis or rate of return analysis, you would find that high-quality early childhood programs have high rates of return they promote skills, they create a base of opportunity, and so they expand social mobility, which is not easily quantified, but they certainly increase the earnings, the capacity, and productivity of the entire economy. The government benefits, the society benefits at large, and the individuals obviously will benefit uh, in the sense they now have enhanced skills, they can do things which they couldn't do before. So in that sense, when you look at wise prioritization of public policy, you will go towards the early years. To understand that right now we typically spend much more money remediating problems than actually uh, preventing them from occurring. And more than just preventing them, building a base which makes people flourish. So it's not just a negative assessment, it's a positive assessment. So I think when you ask what's the state of the economy, can, can, the, can an economy afford this? kind of enterprise. Well, first of all, it's not all about a governmental program. Private organizations within the larger society can support this. This happens in the United States, it happens in Western Europe, it happens in Latin America. So foundations, uh, private organizations, even businesses, state-owned enterprises or private businesses in, 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 in China could help contribute to this cause. There have been a very large number of companies, for example, in the United States and in Latin America supporting these kinds of activities. But the fact of the matter is that even when times are tough, when the kind of downturn has occurred, now in China, people are concerned not about an absolute decline in real income, but a slowdown in the rate of growth. And so the real question is, how are you going to promote growth in the future? What's going to happen? And how is that society going to actually build itself in a way to take advantages not only of future opportunities, but in addition, the problem that in China, the population size will be declining, the population size will be aging, and with it, the labor force will be in decline. So if you think about it more broadly, about what wise economic and social policy would be, you would say what we need is to have a higher quality workforce. We may have fewer bodies, but if they're more skilled, they can produce more. And out of that, they can actually manufacture, or create, I should say, a, a, a society which will still be vibrant, will still have good ideas, will still be able to compete in the international economy, even though one of the raw sources of economic growth in China in the past 30 years will have disappeared, namely this large population that was quite young. You're going to have an older population, but an older population 
essentially can be a population that can be quite productive. And even with a smaller number of young people entering, if they are high, more highly educated or highly engaged in society, less limited than current cohorts of young Chinese children are, the society will benefit. So again, I come back to the point that this is an investment. These investments have high economic and social returns, and as a result of these high returns, that wise expenditure will actually spend money on those early years, and will spend money on helping disadvantaged children get the opportunities available to them, and to build the Chinese workforce and society that's actually highly educated, entrepreneurial, and able to engage not only with its own problems, but with the larger world. Well, I think what China Development Research Foundation is doing, it should continue doing, and doing it in a more strengthened role. What it should do is essentially continue to engage some of the most disadvantaged populations out in rural China. The left behind children, the children growing up in poverty who don't have great opportunity, whose parents may be now working, one or both parents may be working in the cities on the east. I think that its targeting towards disadvantaged children is very wise. I would just say the scale of the activity should probably be expanded above and beyond where it currently is at. So if anything, the China Development Research Foundation should continue its efforts to educate the citizenry, educate the government, educate the whole, raise the level of discussion in China and the world for that matter about the importance of helping disadvantaged children early on in their lives. So I think that is really a tremendous uh, opportunity for it. It's already started this activity, and I hope it will continue it, and, and, and I hope I can work with them in doing it. Early childhood programs should be viewed as part of a larger strategy of building skill. This should be viewed as something, as something which actually is more than just an economic investment, although it is that. It's one that essentially empowers people. It gives them the ability to function on their own, to become autonomous, to become able to contribute to society, and to have a high level of human dignity. So it's a program or a set of programs which essentially are targeting the whole individual. And I would also point out that in much of the discussion in China and East Asia especially, there's an emphasis on PISA test scores, on achievement test scores as being the measure of success of these programs and the measure of success even of an individual school. And if anything is known now in the last 10 or 15 years of research, that's a part of life. Cognitive skills are an important component of success in schools and in life, but they're far from the only important feature of what is actually determining successful lives or successful schools or as measures of anything. So I would urge that the Chinese and the China Development Research Foundation go beyond kind of conventional measures of PISA scores, of test scores that are typically relied on for success. I know that China is very proud of its very high scores in the Shanghai school system. They compete internationally among the highest in the world. But I think China should also ask the question, are those children really ample in all of the skills required for life? Are they creative? Are they thinking more broadly? What about their music? What about their ability to interact with each other? These social and emotional skills that are frequently considered soft skills, not even discussed by governments and international agencies much of the time, those skills really matter. They matter, and it's not just my personal opinion. There are quantitative studies showing how important they are in predicting things like earning, participation in crime, and the like. So I think what I hope China will do is kind of move beyond the PISA mania, move beyond this idea that somehow skills are only embodied in test scores, that it's only somehow an achievement test, or sometimes even an IQ test people talk about that's really relevant for success in life. If you look, for example, at something like what fraction of all earnings would be predicted on average by a high IQ, if you look at the variation across people, you know, there's a lot of variation. How much, how much of the variation in IQ uh, sorry, variation in earnings is explained by the natural occurring variation in IQ. It's not 50%, it's not 25%, closer to 5, 6, 7%. It's, it's important, but it's by far not the whole story. And we know that these other skills are important. They can be shaped. 
just like IQ can be shaped by learning and experience. So what's required, I think, for a successful understanding of how to address the problems of China and to kind of think about what the next steps would be. What will be required, I think, will be that we go forward. We, the larger society, the Chinese society, go forward with broader measures of what works and what doesn't work, how we can gauge success or failure of individuals and institutions, schools, and free schools. But that we also understand that these skills are malleable, they're malleable over the lifetime, and that non-cognitive, social and emotional skills have real economic and social payoffs, but they also empower people.